children can be dismissed for children's church. Join me again in the Gospel of Luke, please, chapter 16. We've been focusing on how we as creatures of time can become more aware of that which we at some level know, and that's eternity. On every piece of currency, every coin that's minted in the United States, we have the phrase, in God we trust. It wasn't always that case. It has interesting roots. I don't know that you'd want to read this, but in 1861, a Pennsylvania preacher petitioned uh, the Secretary of the Treasurer. Now, remember, 1861, we're in the middle of the Civil War. And this particular preacher was thinking, you know, if our society is destroyed, if we destroy ourselves, what will succeeding people remember about us? And how will they know in the middle of the the conflict and the tragedy of the Civil War where we're killing each other, how will they know? It's interesting. He said, uh, you are probably a Christian. What if our republic were not shattered beyond reconstruction? Would not the antiquaries of succeeding centuries rightly reason from our past that we were a heathen nation? In other words, we're behaving ourselves like a heathen nation. And it was he who petitioned the Secretary of the Treasurer to put on every coin and every bill minted in America some reference to the fact that though we don't always behave as such, though we certainly don't always act consistent with our faith, but nevertheless, at the core of our nation, we want to acknowledge God. Secretary Chase instructed James Pollock, who was the director of the Mint, to to prepare a motto. He did some research, and this is the letter he wrote uh, that Secretary Chase wrote to direct Uh, the director, James Pollock. Sir, no nation can be strong except in the strength of God or safe except in his defense. Remember, this is in the middle of the Civil War. The trust of our people in God should be declared on our national coins. You will cause a device to be prepared without unnecessary delay with a motto expressing in the fewest and tersest words possible this national recognition. Good thing they didn't ask me, right? The quarters would be this big. And that's where the phrase, in God we trust, simply came. Later on, about a century later, it was approved as the, abs- you know, the national motto. So a hundred years after that, by the way, we're probably in another war. This question of, are we a heathen nation or not? Are we a nation that's forgotten eternity and forgotten God? And so Congress petitioned that, and that's when the national motto was selected to also be in God we trust. Now, this might be our national motto, but it appears this is our national motivation. Let's just be real. We are a nation, we are a people, at least driven or at at the very least distracted by money. Even we as believers, like in the Civil War, like in the Korean War, like in every every season and, and stage of history, We're dual citizens. We are citizens of this world in which we live. We're also citizens of heaven, according to Jesus. And and as a result, we're often torn between the two trusts of taking care of here and now and also preparing for then and there. Jesus repeatedly addressed this tension that exists in probably every human heart to some degree. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth can corrupt and thieves can break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth does destroy nor thieves can steal. For where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. And then he goes on to say this, to reveal something very significant about the human soul. The light of the body is the eye, what we're focusing on. If your eye is single, in other words, you're focusing on the right things, your whole body should be full of light. But if your eye be evil, ponderous, hurtful, you're focusing on the wrong things, then your whole body should be full of darkness. And if the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? And then he said, nobody, nobody can serve two masters. You can't go in two different directions. Either will hate the one, love the other, cling to the one, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Someone is wisely, I think, tersely, noted that money is a universal passport to everywhere except heaven and the universal provider for everything except happiness. 
Someone described, yeah, we all know money can't bring happiness, but someone says it makes m- misery a lot more tolerable. But God described money as filthy lucre, unrighteous mammon, and he warns us in Timothy, the love of money. Paul goes on to Timothy and warns Timothy, you've got to deal with these issues. We're all humans. We're all torn. We all feel the tug of these two worlds in which we're living between. So Paul told Timothy, beware of those who think that gain is godliness. The more stuff you get, the better you are. From such withdraw yourself. Paul says, we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having therefore food and raiment, let us be there with content. But those that will be rich. Now, this is not those who, the, the idea of the will be is that is their focus. That's the most important thing, money. Those that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drowned men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, but this pursuit of money, the priority of money, the idol of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Have you ever heard the phrase, follow the money, honey? You want to find corruption, find the money. The love of money is the root of all evil, for which while some coveted after they've what? Erred from the faith. They shift their focus away from eternity because they're so wrapped up in time. And they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Money, like fire, can make a great servant. But it makes a terrible master. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the church of Laodicea, who was kind of caught in the middle of eternity and and time. And and they're trying to play it safe by staying in the middle. And and they pursued money, and they thought God would understand. And, And God says, because you say you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and God says you're focusing on the wrong things they chose to kind of stay in the comfortable middle ground and that attitude made God sick according to Revelation chapter 3 last week we talked about two men from Luke 16 one was poor one was rich the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich the poor man did not go to heaven because he was poor the rich man didn't think he needed God because he had everything he wanted The poor man had nothing but his faith. And therefore, that's where his hope was. Lazarus means God is my hope. We saw last week how this rich man who got caught up in this world ended up being cast away into eternity because he lost. He never found the right focus. So my message this morning is how can we forgive the expression use money without it becoming our master. Luke chapter 16, we, we read a portion of this last week. I want to go a little bit more into detail in the first part of it. He said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man. This is not a parable. This is not the kingdom of heaven is like. This is an actual event, of act, an actual story of actual events that Jesus is using. A certain rich man had a steward And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. First of all, let's try to understand or get on the same page about what a steward is. It's not a term that's very common today. We would use the word manager today. How many of you are in a position of a management position at work? In other words, you... You have someone over you, but you also have people under you, and the people over you trust you to handle the people under you and the resources under you. How many have those kind of positions at work? So many of you would understand this concept better than perhaps others. A certain rich man had a steward. The word steward, okinamas, is manager, overseer, literally a fiscal agent. So the context of stewardship is, I'm going to trust you with my money. I'm going to give you the resources and give you the responsibility to manage my resources in my place. And as I said, this was a wealthy man, so it's, it's logical or reasonable that he would spend a lot of time traveling. And while he was traveling, he would have a fiscal agent, someone at home to manage his farm or his company or his household. And he would have resources that he had laid aside to allow this man to do that. This steward or manager has access to the master's resources. The master's in another country. He has the, the key to the lockbox, so to speak. The master has the responsibility to provide for the needs of the steward. It's not you starve. I mean, that doesn't make sense, right? Don't feed my steward. 
uh, th- th- that's not going to be effective. So the master takes care and provides the needs of the, st- uh, of the steward, and the steward invests the, his boss's resources in a way that's consistent with the master. All of you that are managers in some capacity, and you probably have budgets with which you do your job, do you have the liberty or could you, I, should say, I won't say legally, could you perhaps embezzle money and buy yourself a new car or a new toy with, with your boss's money? Now, that could physically happen, yes? But what would the response of your master be? Well, that's what's going on in this parable. He wasted his master's good. Jesus told, or this story, Jesus actually told a story, the kingdom of heaven is like a wealthy man who goes into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom. Before he does, he calls his servants and he gives them money, his money, and says, occupy or invest until I come. Same principle. Now, in the context of stewards or using our modern application managers. Now, many of you are in different technical fields, so of course your education is important. But what would you say from the context of a CEO or owner is the most important qualification for someone that you're going to trust your resources to? What would you think it is? Reliability, honesty. The Bible says it is required in stewards, managers, that a man be found faithful, reliable. The word faithful is pistos in the Greek. It actually means trustworthy. It doesn't matter how highly qualified someone is, and maybe they know their stuff inside out, but if they're crooked at heart, if they're deceitful, if they're covetous, if you can't trust them, then you would be a fool to put your resources in the hands of such a man or such a woman. The greatest ability is really dependability. A certain rich man had a steward. You know, we often in the context of our walk with God, one of the things we struggle the most with is, can I trust God? Isn't that strange that we would ask that question, but do we not ask that question? When God says, do this, and we want to do this, isn't that really an issue of trust? Uh, This is what I think is going to be best. This is what I think is going to work. I was reading in my devotions this morning, Uh, In uh, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In order to surrender, let me give you this. In order to surrender your 401K or your resources to someone else, what do you have to do first? What attitude do you have to have towards that person? Do I like him? Not really relevant, right? Right? If you're going under the blade of a surgeon, do you care primarily what he looks like? What you're looking looking at is, can I trust him that he's going to take care of my life? We often struggle when it comes between God's clearly revealed will and our clearly desired wants. Can I really trust God? What we don't usually consider is the reverse of that question. Can God really trust me? Which of us has a better track record? Isn't it strange that we find it so difficult to trust God? (laughs) So understand that this story, Jesus is making an application because it goes on in the middle of the chapter and says, I'm talking to you. And today through me, he's talking to you and I. So what are we the managers of? What are we accountable for before God? Well, certainly we're accountable for our treasures or our wealth. And here's where the, why I put our in parenthesis, because we think of them as ours. I mean, after all, we earned them. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. How many of you own a home? Can I see here? How many of you have a home that owns you? Okay. We, we think of property. Here in Kansas, people own property, often farms. And, of course, with the farms, if you, there's a huge responsibility. But do you really own that land? You're only going to live so much, so long, and then you're going to die. So at the very best, we can look at the things that we think we own and realize they're only ours for a limited time. We did not create the land. 
we have the legal right perhaps to sell it, but the land will last, outlast us. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we really don't own it. We have the privilege of using it while we're alive. That's the concept of stewardship, and that's what God is saying here. For people who forget this, which is all of us to some degree, yes, when we forget this, it's easy for us to become faithful steward, faithless stewards like the one in this story. Deuteronomy chapter 8, God is bringing his people into the promised land, and God says, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you'd serve the Lord or not. And then he goes on to say, Beware that when you come into this land and you're living in houses you didn't build and you're eating from trees and vines that you didn't plant, beware that your hearts be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. Isn't that logical? I mean, isn't that the way our our minds think as we grow and as we get our, our our particular educations and we begin to learn our particular trades and we begin to get good at it and we begin to get promoted and people start patting us on the back and say you're such a valuable employee or manager isn't there's a little tug on our heart saying yes I am remember that old song I'm great no one knows it no one knows it so far someday they'll realize how wonderful I are They'll look at me and laugh at me, and then they'll shout, hooray, for I'm great, no one knows it. But they will someday. You don't know that song? (laughs) But you've all sung something like that before. This idea when God says, when I bless you, you forget where that brain comes from, where those skills ultimately originated. You forget that I blessed you for a purpose. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the strength of my hand has gotten me this wealth. He's talking about money that we make. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Do not miss this. It's he that gives you the power to make wealth. How many of you know someone with dementia or Alzheimer's? Sad, tragic, right? You know, the God who gives us our brains eventually can shut them off too. How many of you know someone who has a debilitating disease, someone that's relatively young and could still be in the workforce but can't? Now, I'm not saying God is vengeful. I'm simply saying, remember that old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. And God was just reminding his people, I give you these things and I want you to enjoy them, but don't forget me. Our giving or what we do with our wealth is a gauge of our faith and our faithfulness. Leviticus 27, 30, God says the tithe or the tenth is the Lord's. Malachi, that's why Malachi asked the people of, of, of his day about 400 B.C., will a man rob God? Yet you say, wherein have we robbed you? They're, they're not even getting it. God says, you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. You're stealing what belongs to me. And therefore, you're cursed with a curse. Haggai chapter 1, a contemporary Malachi, puts it this way. Is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and my house lie waste? Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. And notice what what Haggai says. You work hard to earn wages, but you earn wages to put them in a pocket with holes in it. Can you associate with that? Where did it all go? Thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. Deuteronomy 14 tells us this, thou shalt truly tithe all of thine increase. Why? Does God need our money? No, we need to be reminded that our money ultimately comes, is a trust from God. We're managing it. God says you should tithe so you can learn to fear me. You can learn to acknowledge me in all your ways. Because of the seductive nature of money, I quoted a moment ago, 1 Timothy chapter 6, about money being the root of all evil. Being rich is not evil. Working hard is not evil. Pursuing reasonable and rational financial goals is not evil, but it is seductive. How many of you know J.P. Getty? Silver investor, billionaire. I read a quote from him one time. He said, I would trade all of my wealth for one happy marriage. If I remember correctly, he was married five times. The point is, even those who obtain that goal of wealth often do it at a terrible price 
of things that are more valuable in the long run than that. So God tells Pastor Timothy, charge them that are rich in this world. Those who have the ability or those who have extra resources, those whom I have blessed, charge them that they be not high-minded, proud, or notice this, trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Charge them that they do good, that they be rich in good works. In other words, they take their resources, their gifts, their abilities, their intellect, their skills, and they invest them in other people. That they be ready to distribute. What, is, what does distribute mean when it comes to money? Give away. But, but whose money is it really? So the ready to distribute means listen to what I tell you. That doesn't mean just empty your bank accounts and give it randomly. But God says, you know, I may be blessing you because I want you to be a channel of blessing to others. So be ready to do that as I direct you. Willing to communicate. What do we think communicate means? Talk about all your money. Kononikos comes from kononos or kononia. Kononia means communion partnership. God says, I, I'm blessing you because I want you to be willing to partner with other people as I, would to direct, as I would direct you. Notice this, laying up for who? For God? Laying up for themselves. What? A good foundation against the time to come. Is this talking about retirement or is this talking about laying up treasures in heaven? Absolutely, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So we're stewards of our, 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 our treasures. We're stewards of our time. That's why I chose that little 60-second blurb. You know, these are self-evident truths. All of us know we're limited. Ephesians chapter 5 says, See then that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly is an old English word. It means cautiously, carefully. It's the idea of walking through a landmine. And there's a lot of tripwires. And as we pursue success in any endeavor, there are a lot of landmines. There's a lot of places we can misstep. There's a lot of times we can get off track. A lot like Paul told Timothy, we can err from the faith is in the pursuit of material wealth. Walk circumspectly or carefully, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The word evil is poneros, diseased infected the days in which we live the culture the current of the culture in which we live is fundamentally infected with covetousness because of this paul says don't be unwise or foolish but understanding what the will of the lord is be not drunk with wine we're in a success but be filled with the holy spirit of god let god's spirit direct you Psalm 90, that David puts, or Moses wrote Psalm 90, puts it this way. So teach us to number our days. Why? What's the point? So we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I'm trying to remember how old I am. Old. At some point, we, none of us know how long we're going to live, right? That Psalm 90 says, the years of our life are three score and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score, yet is their strength weakness. Moses said, you know, the human lifespan is limited is what he's saying. And the older we get, the more limited we become physically. But you know, at some point you get to an age, and I am way past that age, where you realize you're over the hump. And instead of looking forward to all the things you want to accomplish, someday you begin to, you begin to realize, I'm running out of time. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I don't know if I'll go back here next week, but let me summarize this parable for a moment. This steward gets called on the carpet for wasting his, master, his, his boss's goods. And his boss says, you're not going to be steward anymore. Now, we don't know if this happens via a letter or a courier, so the steward panics. And he says, what am I going to do? My Lord takes away from me the stewardship, this plush life that I've been living. I'm fired. So what does he do? When I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. This steward sits down, contacts his, all the people who always boss money and says, how much do you owe? I owe 100 measures of wheat. Okay, quickly, change it to 80 and pay him the 80 now. 
and, and I'll give you a 20% discount. He talks to another, what do you owe my master? And he tells him, he says, change it to this and pay it now. He's crooked. Why would he do that? What do you think this means? When I am put out, I'm losing this job, so I want to get in good with who? I want to get in good with other people who might hire me. Now, by the way, if he's going to cheat on his master, he might cheat on you, right? Let me tell you what, ladies, men. If you are cheating on your husband and wife with someone who is cheating on their husband and wife, why do you think that eventually they may not cheat on you? However, the master commended the unjust steward. And he said this, the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. What did he really commend him for? He was being dishonest. He cheated his, his own master, and now he's still cheating his master by trying to get in good with, with his master's customers. Why would he commend him? He commended him for this primary reason. When he realized time was running out, he did something about it. Jesus then said, make of yourselves friends of unrighteous mammon, that when they may fail, ye may fail, they may receive you into everlasting uh, benefits. What he's basically saying is, use the unrighteous mammon, the resources you have now to invest in eternity, everlasting habitation. In other words, recognize you've wasted the past, you can't change that. You've got a limited opportunity to invest wisely. We're also stewards of our talents. First Peter chapter 4 says, As every man have received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. Notice this, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. First church I pastored, I took it. They had 12 people in it when I became the pastor. And uh, someone had donated a beautiful organ, and there was a, a little baby grand piano up here. 12 people. Nobody would play the piano or the organ. So for the six years I ministered there, I think, uh, it was Gene Kane with his little mandolin, or it was me fumbling along with my guitar. Imagine my surprise when after services, some of the people would get up there and start playing beautifully on the piano or the organ. It was pop music or something. And I remember I approached, there was a, a teenage girl and her mom, and, and uh, they could play beautifully. And I approached them, and it happened to be one of my deacon's wives. And the church was growing a little bit, but I approached them and said, you play beautifully, how come you won't play for church? Nope, can't do that. God had, see, God had placed in that little church people with abilities, but they weren't willing to for whatever reason, to use those abilities to serve the Lord. God says, and I'm not just talking about musical abilities. The Bible says, how many people have received gifts from God? It's everyone. Your gifts, like mine, are not, may not be. Maybe I said that wrong. I can't play chopsticks. We got that? Your gifts may not be musical. But everyone here has talents and abilities. Where'd you get them from? Oh, I'm not saying you didn't have to develop them. But at the core, where'd you get them from? Paul says, what have you received that you were not given? As everyone has received the gift, minister the same. See, the reality is most of us squander our gifts and abilities on ourselves or simply on the temporary nature of the world. Matthew 25, 25, Jesus tells another story. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who goes to the far country, calls his servants, gives them his money, and says, basically, occupy till I come. This is a different one. And, and, and everyone traded. One got five talents, one got, or one got ten talents, one got five talents, one got one talent. A talent was a sum of money, about, I'm thinking about 40 pounds of gold or silver. And after a long time, the master comes back. And he calls his servants, as he will call all of his servants someday, and says, give account of your stewardship. The one that got 10 said, Lord, I've traded, I've invested. Your 10 has gained 10. And Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in the joy of the Lord. And then he turned to the one with five and the same thing. Then the one that got one talent said, Lord, I was afraid. And I hid your talent, notice this, in the earth. 
we'll get back to what happened to that servant in a moment. The last thing I want to share with you that we are to manage, that we are responsible, that we receive from God. We, we can enjoy some of the benefits of it, but it's not ours, and that's our testimony. And by our testimony, I mean our relationship with God, the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, as we were allowed of God to be, notice this phrase, put in trust with the gospel. So we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. The Bible tells us that the gospel is a treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a man that found a treasure in a field, and he sold all that he has so he could buy the treasure, buy the field. God has committed the treasure of his truth to us. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says this treasure, the gospel, is in earthen vessels. You and I. Remember what Jesus said? No man lights a candle and does what to it? Puts it under a bushel. By the way, you put a candle under a bushel, what's going to happen? Either the bushel's going to catch fire or the candle's going to go out. But he puts it on a candle stand so that it can do what? Give light to the whole house. Then Jesus said, let your light so shine before men, women, children, before others. Share, share what I've done for you. This gospel treasure, we have been entrusted with the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. What is the good news? God loved you. He sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins he was buried he rose again the third day that's the good news it's the only hope this world has someone wrote a poem years ago God has no hands but our hands to do his work today no feet has he but our feet to lead men to his way no words has he but our words to tell men that Christ died no lives has he but our lives to guide men to his side we're the only Bible this careless world will read We're the sinner's gospel. We're the scoffer's creed. We're the works of God written in deed and word. But what if the lines are crooked? What if the ink is blurred? What if our hands are busy with other works than his? What if our lives are leading where sin's allurement is? The idea is God has committed his truth. The truth that can change the destiny of a man or woman or a boy or girl. Many of you have that truth in your heart. That's the treasure We're supposed to guard that treasure. And by the way, the word guard means to value. God told Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust. The Greek word for keep is guard. Jude verse 3 says, earnestly contend for the faith. Guard it. It's priceless. But we're also supposed to invest it in the lives of others. To guard doesn't mean to hoard. It just means keep it, keep it clean, keep it pure. Don't allow Satan to mingle it with works or, or religion. The gospel is God's gift of forgiveness. It's not earned, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul told Timothy, what you have heard, share with other people. Jesus said to his disciples, freely you have received, so freely give. And again, Jesus used that parable. I'm giving you something, and I want you to invest what I'm giving you until I come back. So God trusts us with the treasures that we have or our resources. He trusts us with the time that we have, and time is opportunity. He trusts us with various talents or abilities that he's given for, to us so we can use our treasures, our time, and our talent, at least in part, to invest in helping people recognize the treasure of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that people, even when they read the Bible, their eyes are blind. Like Moses, when he came down off of the mountain with the commandments, his face shone so the people of Israel were uncomfortable, so he had to put a veil over his face. Second Corinthians chapter 3, that veil is still there over the human heart whenever God's word is read. They don't see it. Then he says, but, but then he goes on in the end of verse three or chapter 3, but, but we who have that treasure, we who have recognized God, we have responded to God, we need to keep focusing on God's word. We, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, what happens? We're changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. God grows us up. God helps us to become more like him. God conforms us to the image of his son. God helps us to be more compassionate. God helps us to be more sensitive to people around us. For what purpose? So we can get ahead in this world? No. So we can use our time, our treasures, our talents to invest in the lives of others. That's chapter 3. That's how it close. Chapter 4 opens. Therefore, 
seeing we have this, what is that word? Ministry. What ministry? The ministry of growing in our relationship with God for the purpose of helping other people recognize God. As we've received mercy, we faint not. But renouncing the hidden things of dishonesty, my manifestation of the truth, God's word, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But the next verse says this, but if our gospel is hid, it's hid to those who are lost, people who still have that veil over their heart. They're aware of God, but they don't recognize God. In whom the God, little g, of this world, who is that class? Satan. He blinds the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in their hearts. For we preach not ourselves, not about me, not about you. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves. You're what? Not your masters. You're servants. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has done what? Shines in our hearts. Hear me carefully, please. If you are really a child of God, you're a child of God because God commanded that light. He turned the lights on in your heart one day. You recognize several things. One, when you turn the lights on in a filthy room, what's the first thing you notice? The filth. If God's ever really turned the lights on in your heart, you don't see all the good, you see all the bad. You see the woe is me, for I am undone. You see that all my righteousnesses are like filthy rags. You see yourself guilty before a holy God. But you know, that light doesn't stop there. It shines on the cross of Jesus Christ. He said, now you've seen yourself. Let me show you how much I love you. And you see Jesus dying in your place for all of that evil that you and I have done. That's what God commanding the light to shine in the darkness. And then God says, and now I offer you forgiveness. Will you receive it? As many as received, not religion, him. To them gave God the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God who commanded the light to shine in the darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ this treasure. Where is it? In earthen vessels. That the excellency, the power might be of God, not of us. What am I saying? What Paul said, we have been entrusted with the treasure of the gospel. We are stewards of it. How many of you are Elvis fans? Come on, be honest. Okay. You may or may not like what I'm about to tell you. January 2010, Priscilla Presley was interviewed by Matt Lauer. That would have been the 75th birthday of Elvis had he lived. This is what she said when Matt said, what do you think Elvis would be doing if he was still alive? Notice her words. I think Elvis would always be a part of music, no matter what. It was in his blood. I don't know if he'd be doing rock and roll at 75, I think maybe he'd be going into gospel. Maybe even preaching a little bit. How many of you find that a little surprising? I did. He loved to teach and he loved the Bible. So what happened to Elvis? Elvis was raised in an assembly of God church, by the way. Elvis claimed to be born again. At the peak of his career, he came to his preacher this is what this preacher recorded that he said, Pastor, I'm the most miserable young man you've ever seen. I got all the money I'll ever need to spend. I've got millions of fans. I've got friends. But I'm doing what you taught me not to do. And I'm not doing the things you taught me to do. Interestingly enough, Elvis's widow and daughter joined the Church of Scientology, a cult out of California. Now, the point I'm making about this, I don't know Elvis. I know a man who witnessed to Elvis in an elevator in Texas, and Elvis said, whoa, preacher, I'm already a Christian. And the man who told me the story was Dr. Jack Hiles. And Dr. Jack Hiles, with his current calm, brazen, he said, then good Lord, man, what in the world are you doing? And Elvis smiles, I'm just having fun. Just having fun. Someday... We will all have the scene of Luke 16 portrayed in our lives. Someday, our master will call us, if we're his children, and said, give account of your stewardship. 
Elvis happened in all of his music, he only won three Grammy Awards, and every one of them were for gospel music. I thought that was interesting, too. In 1972, he won his second Grammy for the album, He Touched Me. One of the songs on this album that Elvis sang is the song, He's My Everything. Don't lose me, I'm going somewhere with this. I remember my days of darkness without sunshine or sight to lead the way. But a whisper of his voice softly calling to the arms of my maker to stay. He is my reason for living. He is the king of kings. I long to be his possession. He is my everything. Notice the last word, verse. After the lightning and thunder, after the last bell has rung, I want to bow down before him and hear him say, well done. Now, I want to be really careful here because I don't know any human heart. Elvis Presley, if I remember correctly, died in 1977 of a drug overdose alone in a hotel room. Some of you may have more information. That's the story I read. What I'm saying is there apparently was something in Elvis's heart that recognized, I'm going to have to stand for God someday, and this is what I want to have happen. But in his own words to his preacher, he got sidetracked, pursuing something that in his own admission couldn't really satisfy. This song is a reference to that scene we mentioned a few moments ago in Matthew chapter 25. Some of the servants who were faithful to use their treasures, their time, their testimony, their talents to invest in something that would honor the king did hear, well done thou good and faithful servant. But one of them did not. The one who buried his master's treasures and talents and resources. What did he hear? Thou wicked and slothful servant. He was still a servant. He was just a, a faithless servant like the faithless steward of Luke 16. Thou, you ought to have put my money, my resources, not yours, mine, to the exchangers. Put them in a safe investment, if nothing else. You were left with the responsibility to invest for me. 